Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. As promised in my Kodak Gold 200 video, today I'm going to walk you through the process of converting some of these negatives going from this to this. We're going to be doing this in Lightroom using a plugin called Negative Lab Pro. However, if you don't use Lightroom, there are other options out there. There's some standalone software that doesn't require any use of Lightroom or any Adobe products, and we'll take a look at one of those in just a little bit. But let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right in and start converting some of these negatives. So again, these are all photos from the Kodak Gold 200 video, and we're going to go through the process from start to finish so you can see exactly how I do it. Um, the first thing we're going to do is grab our white balance dropper here. Go ahead and sample that off of the film borders. Now we're going to crop this in. You can see that I need to crop in quite a bit. Uh, when I scanned these in, I didn't realize just how much room was, uh, you know, outside of the negative. So I definitely could have gotten this a much tighter scan. However, I use the Lumix S5 II, the multi-shot mode. Basically, you know, it stitches a bunch of photos together. So I end up with like a 96 megapixel file or something ridiculous. Uh, definitely overkill for most uses, but if I ever feel like I need a high-res version, it's nice to just always have that right off the bat. Definitely not essential, though. You can use a much lower resolution and get perfectly fine results. But now we're ready. We're going to go ahead and hit Control n This is going to pull up Negative Lab Pro. This is version 3.0.2. I just recently upgraded to version 3, and I will say it's definitely worth it. Uh, it gives you a little bit more control, and I think that just the the software's initial sort of analysis of the negative, basically giving you a good starting point, I feel like it's much closer now right off the bat. You're still going to need to do some tweaks, which we'll get into, but uh, version 3, I'd say it's worth it. And this is what we've got right off the bat, and I've got to say... Uh, we're not far off. I feel like this is already looking pretty good. If we kind of sample through some of these settings up here, you can see there are different sort of presets. Uh, this is not meant to uh, give you like an end result, more so a starting point. And I do use Frontier quite a bit, but I would say the Kodak Gold, it doesn't always look the best, even though I'm using Kodak Gold film that I'm scanning. Uh, a lot of times I'll choose the frontier setting and then just make my adjustments from there. Sometimes gold looks a little too muddy as a starting point, but this feels pretty good. Granted, the brightness is way, way up. Um, the tone profile, this is another thing that it's going to give you a lot of different options. You have different things for cinematic, lab, or linear, and all sorts of variants in between. We're just going to click through some of these so you can get an idea as to what it looks like. You can see you have, you know, more contrasty profiles, uh, some soft, more flat profiles. I'm usually somewhere in the linear tone profiles, usually linear itself. However, uh, linear gamma, this does look pretty good. If we brought the brightness way down, though, you can see gamma is going to be really contrasty. If I go to linear, it's a little bit better. Um, I think we're going to go with the linear version. And I just convert each negative individually. You can do batch processing or batch conversions, but I figure if I'm going to need to fine tune the photos anyway, I might as well just do it one image at a time. Highlights and shadows on this one already look pretty good. Uh, if we go here to the white and the black clipping points, if I bring this down, that's going to make sure I don't lose any detail in the whites. As you can see, while I'm doing this, it is adjusting the color a little bit, but we're going to continue working with the color, so I'm not really concerned about that right now. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure the contrast and getting all of my white points and black points, keeping everything nice and uh, not clipping. As I'm making these adjustments, you can actually see the histogram over here is changing along with it. So, But I think we'll go negative 4 on the white clip, negative 2. Again, it's not the same for every single photo, just kind of going by feel here. But I think I do want to bring the shadows up just a bit over here in these trees. Uh, this was clearly shot, you know, in early afternoon, maybe like 1 o'clock or so. So really bright sun. It was a bright scene. Bringing the darks up like that, you can see how drastic of a difference it makes just working with this slider here. But I think just bringing it up just a little bit, if I bring the lights down even further, it's going to start to look a little too flat for my liking. As long as I'm not clipping in the highlights, I don't mind if, you know, everything is bright because that's how it felt. But let's take a look at the color and the white balance adjustments here. 
First of all, the HSL, you have different profiles to use here. There's natural, this is lab, crystal, and pack on. Remember pack ons? That feels like a lifetime ago. We're going to stick with natural here and the white balance. Uh, you can see you have a bunch of different presets. These presets to me, I find, I don't want to say useless, but I'm always fine tuning things. So it's always going to be a custom profile, but they are, at least some of them are good for a starting point. Auto mix and auto neutral. These are usually two starting points that I go with. Auto warm is, yeah, definitely too warm, too green. Auto mix. This feels like a pretty good starting point. We can kind of fine tune things from here. Bring the yellow down just a little bit. Maybe it's feeling a little kind of pink and magenta in here. So let's bring the tint down maybe just one or two points. That already feels better. I don't remember what it was set at to begin with, but I think this feels pretty good. Of course, you can go into the mids, highs, and shadows, and you have a lot of control here to make those adjustments individually. For instance, if I go into the highs right here, if I make just one point adjustments, you can see in real time how much of a difference that makes. Still might be a little red, so if we go in here to the red and cyan adjustment in the highs, just one click to the cyan, that feels a little bit more natural. Lab Glow and Lab Fade, these are two adjustments that usually if I am making any adjustment to it, it's very close to the middle here, so maybe a little less or a little more. Again, it really depends on the photo. I think maybe negative five on the lab glow. Lab fade, you can see this adjustment here. Uh, if I bring it way up, the shadows kind of have this like faded sort of look, which I'm not really a fan of. I like to have decent contrast. We're going to leave lab fade exactly where it's at. But this right here is basically all of the adjustment I've done. You can see it's really not that much. There are some more adjustments you can make if you go into the advanced tab here. Curve points, you can have it set to auto, smooth, precise, or manual. You can see as I make these adjustments, it's going to tweak things ever so slightly. I usually leave this on auto. Process order, uh, color first or tones first. From my understanding, this is sort of, you know, letting you choose what takes priority, the color or the tones. If we go tones first, you can see it makes a little bit of a difference, but color first is usually what I keep it at. Uh, color density. We can add density, we can have it set to neutral, or we can subtract density. So if it's a little bit too contrasty right out of the gate, going with subtract density, that's also going to flatten things out if you didn't do that in the editing stage to begin with. But add density, have just a little bit more punch. Um, that's kind of what I think I'm going to go with on this one. Color method, you can choose basically how the color is set. Shadow weighted, highlight weighted, midtone weighted, linear dynamic, or linear fixed. As we click through these, you're going to see this is going to make a big difference here. Uh, I usually choose shadow weighted, but just for the sake of demonstration, I want to show you all the different options. Uh, shadow weighted, this looks good to me. Toning method, standard or vintage toning. Every single time, this is like the one constant standard toning. Uh, anytime I've tried vintage toning just to, you know, take a look, I never go with it. I always stick with standard toning and clip method, the protect color balance or linear. If we go to linear, you can see the colors shift a little bit more. Uh, having the protect color balance selected, for me, it just feels more balanced. So, And then your positive copy settings, you are going to get a positive copy of the inverted negative scan we're going to take a look at that in just a second, but this is where you can kind of dial in those settings. Go back here to edit, make copy is selected. That's going to be your positive copy. We hit apply and now it's going to do two things. It's going to make all of these adjustments to the negative file and then it's also going to create a positive file. So down here, this is our raw file. And if we go to this one, you can see it's a positive TIFF format. Now, if I go back to the negative and I hit R to crop, you can see we've still got all this information here. If I make, you know, uh, exposure up, it's going to get darker. And if I go exposure down, it's going to get brighter. Again, we're working with a negative, so everything is reversed. The nice thing about these TIFF files is now everything is working exactly how it should. Exposure up is going to bring the exposure up and not down. Highlights affect the highlights, shadows, you know, so on and so forth. If you're not able to get the photo exactly where you want it in Negative Lab Pro itself, you are able to take this positive file and then work with it in Lightroom for any kind of fine tune adjustments. 
This to me is something I do every single time. Negative Lab Pro is a really great software uh, plugin, I guess. It's a good way to get things very close, but working with a positive file like this, this just makes things a little bit easier to make those fine tune adjustments. For instance, the white balance here, I'm pretty happy with where this is at. Maybe if we go up plus one on the white balance, again, a quick before and after, it's very, very subtle. Uh, but it's nice being able to make fine tune adjustments here. I took away a little bit of that magenta and negative lab pro, but now it's feeling just a little bit too green. I feel like if I make just a small, you know, plus three, maybe, yeah, plus three on the magenta slider right here, that to me already looks a lot better. But that's how negative lab pro works. And that was a very time consuming process, just going through the explanation of everything. So now I'm just gonna try and work on one a little bit quicker so you can see in real time uh, what it's like to use a software like this. So make my crop, control negative, control N. <laughs> Here, let me reset everything. I think it might have saved, so let me uh, start from just a perfectly clean slate. Negative Lab Pro standard, lab standard, everything is zeroed out. White balance, it's set to auto neutral. I would say auto mix. We're going to go auto mix on this. Settings, negative lab pro. Again, Kodak gold, definitely too green, too muddy. I know I'm going to, you know, brighten things up, but right off the bat, that doesn't look right to me. If I go to frontier, it's definitely closer. Um, still very green though. Bring the magenta slider up just a little bit. Uh, might be too much. Work with the temperature. Sun was setting right here. That to me feels like a better starting point. Bring the darks up just a little bit. Bring my white clipping down just a little bit. Now it's way too magenta just for making that adjustment. Adjusting the lab glow. Tin feels good. Fade, let's bring that down. Let's go neutral on this one. Uh, probably stick with shadow weighted. Ah, Midtone weighted, that feels good. Go back to this. I'm gonna leave that at eight. Okay, that looks better. Let's go with the positive file. Uh, you can see here if I make fine adjustments, uh, this maybe negative two on the temp. Still a little magenta. Maybe go negative two there as well. Quick before and after. Subtle, but it makes a difference uh, in the highlights specifically. I think just that one adjustment. Yeah. Maybe bring the shadows down just a little bit. There we go. Before, after. That feels good to me. Now that is Negative Lab Pro. We are now going to take a look at a software called Film Lab. This is new to me. I haven't purchased this software. I just downloaded the free trial. But I figured since I'm going to make this video, we would check it out together. I've done a couple of conversions already, and I will say I'm pretty impressed with what it can do. We'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of each afterwards, but let's dive into this and uh, see what we can do with it. Now for me, I did have to convert this photo from the Panasonic RAW file format to DNG format just so it was compatible. Most camera brands are natively supported within Film Lab, but for Panasonic, I had to convert to DNG, but not that big of a deal, just an extra step. So for this process, you've got color positive, color negative, black and white negative, and then two older versions of Film Lab. Uh, this is Film Lab version three, and I believe it's still in beta. So this isn't necessarily the finished version three, but you can see it's already pretty impressive. If we click color negative right off the bat, it goes ahead and converts the negative. We've got a lot of extra space here to get rid of. So we're gonna go with the crop tool. And again, this is all a standalone software. You're not working within Lightroom. This is completely by itself. And we'll go with that. Zoom out just a little bit. I can't zoom out a little bit. Sometimes I like to make the photo a little bit smaller in order to uh, have some negative space around it. Can't do that apparently. Just from a starting point, I'm gonna go over here to the adjustments, the density slider. This is going to make a massive, massive difference, especially where you're going to start. You can fine tune things over here, but just for the starting point, let's bring that down to 
I would say right there. That feels good to start with. The film stock, you can choose what film stock you're scanning. Uh, there's not obviously every single film stock out there, but it's a good way to find a starting point. There is Kodak Gold 200, but you'll notice when I click this, it makes everything very, very blue. Um, and I didn't adjust the white balance at all. You can see the white balance won't change if I go back to Portra 400, it's still there. I don't know why that is. Um, if I, you know, take the Gold 200 and then warm it up, that does work, but it just confuses me why it would be like that. I'm not really sure. Uh, we'll go ahead and stick with this though, just for the time being. Scanning device, standard camera. You can see there's Canon, Nikon, Sony, a bunch of different options right here, depending on what you use to scan the negative, but we're gonna use standard camera. Scanning light source, there is negative supply CRI 95. That's the light source I'm using. It's nice that they have a couple of negative supplies official light sources, but there's also just, you know, your sort of generic presets for uh, other light sources out there. But I have the CRI 95 fall off correction. Uh, my scanning setup, I don't really have to deal with this, but if you're dealing with stray light kind of causing some issues with light fall off, especially in the corners, you can make that adjustment right here. Again, back to the adjustments on the density and the white balance. We're going to bring that just up a little bit. Maybe cool that down. And don't want it to be too green. That feels, eh, I don't know, it might still be a little, little too magenta. That might be a little bit too yellow now. One point. Okay. We'll start here, shadow density. If I bring this down, the shadows are gonna go up. If I bring it up, shadows are going down. Bring the shadow density up just a little bit. Skin tone is still not where I want it. Um, you can see the highlight density. This is gonna obviously control the highlights. Skin tone is still not where I want it, I think. Maybe if I bring the highlights here, a little too blue magenta feeling. They're slightly back up in the yellow. Uh, noise removal. I'm going to bring that all the way down. I scan everything at the native ISO of the Lumix at ISO 100. Uh, so I don't need to worry about having, you know, a noisy image and I don't want it to try and remove the film grain uh, or just, you know, lose some sharpness in that process. Sharpening as well. We can turn that uh, or make that adjustment as we see fit. You see this is no sharpness. Uh, you can definitely go overboard and over sharpen it. But if you have it kind of on the low end, nice and subtle, that's nice. And uh, fine tuning your brightness and your contrast. So you do have more adjustments you can make down here, even after going through the dodge and burn section. Bring brightness up a little bit, contrast, and yeah, maybe half a point. That right there to me, that feels pretty good. I hope that was helpful to see how Negative Lab Pro works and also how Film Lab works. Film Lab is not the only alternative to Negative Lab Pro. There are other options out there. This is just the one that out of everything I've seen, it seems like it's probably the closest in comparison or at least just what I would use if I wasn't using Negative Lab Pro. But of course, plenty of options out there. Do your research. You might find something that works better for you. And I do have my own thoughts on Negative Lab Pro versus Film Lab and sort of the pros and cons of each. And we'll get into that right after I thank our sponsor for this video, Squarespace. I built my own website, mattdayphoto.com, with Squarespace over 10 years ago, way before they sponsored this channel, before I even had a YouTube channel. It's the best all-in-one place to build a website. It's incredibly easy to set up. You have tons of different templates to choose from. Everything is drag and drop customizable, so you can still fine tune things to fit your specific look. And if you need help with anything, they have 24 seven award-winning customer service. My website is where I share work from personal projects, where I send out my email newsletter every single month to all of you. And it's even where I have my own online store where I sell prints, zines, photo books. I have a new photo book available right now. There's a link down below. Everything I do runs through Squarespace. So I would encourage you to check it out for yourself and see just how easy it is. You can get a free trial at squarespace.com, but go to squarespace.com slash Matt Day when you're ready to launch. Use the code Matt Day at checkout and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So thank you again to Squarespace for supporting this channel, sponsoring this video, and now let's get back into this conversation. Me personally, if I had to choose between a standalone software or a plugin for Lightroom, 
This is going to come down to the person individually, but for me, I think having Negative Lab Pro as a plugin for Lightroom, it just fits my workflow and how I organize my files and even process things. It just fits me so much better than having a standalone software. Of course, the downside to using this is you're going to have to pay for Lightroom subscriptions, Adobe's Creative Cloud and all of their subscription models. Uh, it's not ideal. It's not great. I'm not a fan of it. But I've used Lightroom for so long, and it's how I organize my files. For me, it just works best with what I do and how I like to organize. But if you're not already using Lightroom, if you're not already paying for that Adobe subscription, it's tough to say, yeah, it's worth it just so you can use Negative Lab Pro because I'm really impressed with what Film Lab can do as well. Based off of what I've seen online from the older version of Film Lab to where it is now, as well as the original version of Negative Lab Pro to where it is now, both of these have changed and improved a lot over the years, and I would imagine they're going to continue to do so. I'm not here to tell you which one of these you should use. You might not even want to use either of these. You might want to use a different software out there, something that I've never even heard of. This is just me sharing my experience, what I typically use, and what I like about it, and I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions or recommendations of your own, please leave a comment down below and we'll keep the conversation going. But that's it for today. So thank you guys for watching. I love you all. I'll see you next time.